Welcome to our Johns Hopkins Biomedical Informatics and Data Science Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Paul Naji. I am the, the Director of Education for our graduate training programs. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, this is our first uh, kickoff of the Grand Rounds for the fall season. Uh, and uh, we have a, a great lineup this fall, and uh, we've added several new courses in our program, and we have uh, a slew of new students uh, to go. So we're really excited about our first uh, lecture uh, by Dr. Abramoff, and to introduce him is our esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Harold Lehman. And uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Abramoff. I'll just give you the formal uh, bio first, that he is a fellowship trained retina specialist and a computer scientist and an entrepreneur. He's the Robert Wutsky Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Science at University of Iowa with a joint appointment in the College of Engineering. He's founder and executive chairman of Digital Diagnostics, the autonomous AI diagnostic company that was the first in any field of medicine to get FDA clearance or de novo uh, approval for an autonomous uh, artificial intelligence tool, and you'll hear more about that, author of over 350 peer-reviewed publications, cited over 45,000 times, and the inventor of 20 issued patents. Now, I've been working with Dr. Abramoff for the last five years, pulled in by Dr. Risa Wolf, a, a pediatric endocrinology here. My role has been decision modeling, but uh, in it's been a real pleasure and education to, to see somebody who's so who really marries the domain of uh, the a medical domain, uh, ophthalmology and ret retinal, uh, uh, ret retinology in particular, and the informatics. Um, and at the same time that he wor he's worried about, you know, getting a company that's financially solvent, also addressing ethical issues from really from, from uh, deep uh, in. It's very ironic that this session is not approved for CME credit because of, uh, we, we, we couldn't get through the 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 um, bureaucratic uh, 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 hurdles to get ethical review, and yet this is an, a talk about the ethics of AI. So, with that irony in mind, and with the the depth of uh, experience we have to, to deal with, Dr. Bramov, I leave it and kick it off to you. Well, thanks so much, Harold, for these nice words and for for the introduction, and and Paul also. Uh, and like you say, this is not uh, this doesn't count for CME. But I, I I did attempt to be as neutral as possible, to make it about uh, ethics and AI, not about you know the company or anything. And Harold did a great uh, intro, so I will not go over that. Um, I do have to declare these conflicts of interest uh, that Harold already mentioned. There's several others that are listed here. I'm active in various uh, groups uh, about AI reimbursement, CPT. Um, uh, even the ethics of AI working with FDA, as you will see. And so why are we discussing ethics uh, and AI? Well, I think there's many healthcare problems and uh, pointing out a few of them here. Uh, and in my view, and uh, there's no evidence for that, these can be solved by uh, specifically autonomous artificial intelligence. And I will get back to you specifically what I mean by autonomous. But the, the more important thing is what are these problems? Well, there's uh, giant health disparities in access and other uh, aspects of, of healthcare in the, in the US and everywhere, really. Um, core, core of that is really a productivity issue. And uh, we and others have shown that even though productivity in almost all sectors in the economy is rising, you see that on the top right in the green, uh, healthcare productivity has actually been declining. And these are BLS numbers, so pretty authoritative numbers. As, as, a, as, a, as a healthcare system, we are seeing fewer patients per hour, treating fewer patients per hour than even 20 years ago. So of course that leads to rising prices, even everything else being equal. Um, also there's a big demand uh, versus uh, supply issue on the bottom right. Uh, with an aging population and a more obese population, there's more and more demand for healthcare, but the population of clinicians and being trained and other healthcare workers is simply not able to keep up with that. So that's another source of, of big problems. I like the illustration on the bottom left because it, it's so, so in a simple picture really shows what is at issue here, this, this access problem. So all the way on the left, you see the eye care availability, meaning where, where ophthalmologists and more dark purple is more ophthalmologists per county. You can see that's clearly 
concentrated on the coasts and not, for example, in Iowa, which is in the center um, where I'm from. And then the eye care need in this case, specifically the biggest eye care need is for people with diabetes. And the more red uh, in the center image of the, the US map, um, the more uh, people per county with diabetes. And you can clearly see that's focused in the Southeast, but there's not you know, more ophthalmologists just in that area. So you see this discrepancy geographically between um, you know, supply and demand. Uh, and that's also the case for, for example, inner cities and many other areas where underserved populations live. Many reasons for that, but there, there are racial, uh, economic and other disparities in, in healthcare. And uh, you know, we propose and we have, we're starting to show that autonomous AI can solve that. So what do I mean by this term autonomous AI that I keep hammering on? Um, and by the way, I don't know whether that's true, Harold, but uh, if you have questions during my talk, please put them in the chat, I think. And then you know, we'll happen to either answer them during or after the talk. Um, so on the left, you see uh, most AI is assistive um, or augmentative. There's, there's, there's a few definitions now, but as a group, it means that there's still a physician ultimately responsible or another provider for the medical decision that is made on a patient. That also means that the liability for the, is for the clinician. It also means, and that's really important to realize, that in some way the patient is already in the care workflow. They already have access and they're already with a provider in some way, otherwise assistive AI has no role to play. So the, the value of that is really to improve outcome, maybe more efficient, hopefully, but that's not always the case for individual patients. On the right, you see autonomous AI, which is where the medical decision is truly made by the computer. There's no human expert like a physician like me looking at, uh, in this case, the images or the data. Uh, that also means, and we have done a lot of work on that with AMA and with you know, Duke uh, Margulis Center for um, Digital, uh, D D Digital Health. The liability is for the AI creator, not for the physician or the provider using it. This allows it to be point of care and immediate wherever the patient is rather than where a provider is, right? On the left, there has to be a provider. For the autonomous AI, you do, you do not need a provider. And the real world value, therefore, is not only to improve outcomes for patients, but also to be able to address disparities where people have no or limited access. Now you can give that access by putting an autonomous AI rather than a physician or other provider in that place. So um, is that real? And, and many people still think that you know, autonomous AI will never be approved by FDA or never reimbursed. It's always interesting to run into it, but no, yes. In 2018, the FDA, uh, Harold was already mentioning that for the first time ever, the Novo cleared, which is a, a very technical term for essentially approval, for the first time ever, an uh, autonomous AI, a, a computer making a medical decision. And uh, it is for a, uh, an eye disease called diabetic retinopathy including macular edema. The accuracy of the system you see on the right uh, picture, this was taken during the COVID pandemic. It's more accurate than any retina specialist such as me. It makes this point of care diagnosis in minutes. There's no human oversight of the, the medical decision. And also very important, uh, the output predicts visual outcome if patient not treated. So the, the, the output of the AI is related to the clinical outcome. Uh, and that will be important later on. It's uh, primarily being used widely across the US in primary care and retail clinics with minimally trained operators. And essentially you only need an electrical outlet for a high quality diagnosis to be available uh, forever. I did want to, uh, people ask me that. And so if you have a question about LLMs and, and ChatGPT, um, you know, with visual, otherwise not much come up, but I did want to say that AIs in general, and even this AI that I just mentioned, that's autonomous AI, is a true commodity. And here's two lines of prompt for, uh, I think, ChatGPT, it was, I did it a few months ago, uh, how to generate a complete, uh, well-functioning uh, autonomous AI for the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. You literally need, need only two sentences, and anyone can do this uh, themselves. So really, not a big challenge to create these AIs. It's how you put them into use and all the context around it, including very important the ethics that, that we will be discussing. And so uh, the remainder of my talk will be creating the guardrails or the ethical system and what that means for autonomous AI in healthcare. And I really like this sort of, it's about a timeline and a sequence of steps where on the, on the left, uh, it starts with, well, you have some diagnostic AI algorithm, right? And, and what does it take to all the way on the right 
to improve patient outcomes, to improve health disparities, health equity, to actually prove that you do what you envision uh, the, such an AI doing. And there's a, a number of steps that need to be taken that we will be discussing. It starts with a foundation in ethics. Um, you know, we published uh, an ethical AI, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an ethical framework for AI that you can use to measure uh, the, the, how, how far an AI or any system really me uh, meets certain uh, ethical principles. Uh, and that that is being used really as a foundation for all the rest that is coming. And that's why I think ethics are, are, are really at the, the foundation for successful implementation, uh, especially of autonomous AI in healthcare. Um, discussing for eight years, and that, that discussion continues on how to regulate AI with FDA, that's the next step, that ethical framework really came in handy. How do you think about AI bias? How do you think about liability? How do you think about autonomy of the patient? How do you think about clinical outcome? And how do you prove any of this? How do you design it? All of that needed to be solved before in 2018, FDA took that momentous, in my view, decision. The next step we had to solve for liability. If I tell you as a provider, as a physician, or you know, I hear there's many physicians in the, in the audience, that if the AI, the autonomous AI that you allow and, and say, well, I'm, I'm not making this diagnosis, I'm letting the AI do it because I'm not comfortable making this diagnosis because maybe I'm a primary care physician, or an endocrinologist, and I do not want to diagnose diabetic retinopathy myself because I do not have the, the, the expertise. If you're then held liable for any errors that the AI will make, then you know I would recommend you do not use that. That would be you know not, not very smart in my view. And so uh, it's very important, I think, that the AI creator is held liable for the performance of the AI. And we have taken that uh, statement. It's included in, in, in contracts uh, with, with health systems. And I think that's a, that's a very important principle, and I'm excited to, to mention that the American Medical Association included that in its AI policy that came out in 2019 and was recently updated. Then, uh, you know, one important aspect, especially in the last few years, uh, the, the, the concerns about racial bias, uh, and, and there have been several studies now showing that uh, specific AIs that were used to um, for care pathways, not so much the FDA regulated part, but typically uh, without any oversight from FDA, AIs that were harming black patients was a paper in science, for example, in 2020 by my friend uh, um, Ziad Obermeyer. We'll get back to that. So how do you mitigate that? How do you address that? And actually, two days ago, uh, FDA and I published a very, in my view, exciting paper, how to look at uh, AI bias, how to mitigate uh, in, in order to improve health equity along the entire life cycle of the AI from concept all the way to deployment and where it's being used in the real world. And we'll get back to that. Standards of care, uh, very important. Uh, providers typically use uh, standards of care. So if you're not included as, a, as an AI, as an autonomous AI, you know, people are less likely to use it. And that's very exciting that a patient organization, the American Diabetes Association, included autonomous AI for the diabetic eye exam um, in its standards of care. Uh, also important, and now we're getting to um, really what, what leads to uh, adoption and, de and deployment, is all the things that are financial. Um, how do physicians, healthcare systems get uh, rewarded by um, using uh, these systems? Uh, you have so-called quality measures. Uh, you, uh, if you're a provider, you definitely have heard about MIPS and HEDIS. And one of them is the diabetic eye exam care gap. And so it was very important when the National Committee for Quality Assurance included using autonomous AI to close the care gap uh, for HEDIS and, and then later uh, CMS did the same for MIPS. Um, there's financial uh, incentives that you get from closing care gaps for your patients, for healthcare systems, typically not for individual providers, as well as for payers. But ultimately also reimbursement was uh, a big, um, big uh, issue needed to be solved. Uh, and thanks again, in my view, to the ethical framework and the support from really all stakeholders in healthcare, um, CMS really went with uh, you know the proposed fifty-five dollars per per exam, uh, which doesn't go to uh, a creator of an AI. It goes to the provider using uh, the AI. Let's say you're a primary care provider and an endocrinologist, you can use an AI uh, for the diabetic eye exam and get uh, reimbursed for that. Um, many professional societies like the American Medical Association, American Academy of Ophthalmology, really people think that they would be concerned about uh, AI doing the job that normally ophthalmologists would be expected to do, but in fact are the biggest proponents. So it was a CPT code created 
nationwide Medicare payment, and you know it, it amounts to about $80 per patient. And now this year, for the first time, very happy to say that uh, Nature uh, accepted the paper of us on productivity increases due to autonomous AI. We're still waiting for the final verdict on, on health equity benefits, but there's definitely already peer-reviewed literature showing that health equity benefits and is improved with autonomous AI. So this path needed to be traversed. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, eth ethics were at the forefront and, and the key to that. And so why uh, are ethics so important? And, you know, I'm typically seen top right as this person, you know, trying to involve everyone and explaining why all of these different players are important, but they are. And so it starts with patients and patient organizations, populations and their representations, for example, in Congress, like the NAACP. Physicians and other provider organizations like the American Medical Association, A creators, uh, I count myself among them, but there's many uh, AI creators out there, uh, from maybe some of you in the, in the audience, bioethicists, regulators like FDA, but also the Federal Trade Commission, value-based care organizations, I already mentioned NCQA, but there's PCORI, USPSTF, payers like CMS, and of course commercial payers like United, Aetna, etc. Medicaid, very important, almost daily meetings with various Medicaid organizations about what they do with autonomous AI. Of course, investors, if 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 this technology uh, to develop this uh, long, uh, 10 years, more than 10 years of R&D, large cost for the clinical trials. So you need in some way to find investors and they need to be excited about a sustainable business model. And as legislators, of course, Congress, many interactions, uh, including this week with Congress on you know how to regulate and, and look at uh, AI, make sure that it's uh, for the benefit of patients, not for the harm of patients. So all of these have influence on what happens to AI. And also all of them have various concerns about AI. And I will just name a few of them. Will it benefit me? Or if you're not a patient, will it benefit patients? Will it be improve outcomes? Will it exacerbate rather than improve health disparities? What happens to the data, the patient data? Is there racial ethnic bias? Who's liable for errors? And who pays for all of this? I already sort of talked about how you know we, we, we're starting to address that, but these are valid concerns. You cannot ignore them. And there's two ways of go about it. You can say, well, um, let me see, sorry. Uh, well, for one example of, of this uh, racial bias is a very recent proposed rule from the Office of Civil Rights in the uh, Department of Human uh, Health Services, uh, where essentially it says that anyone who uses a digital health algorithm uh, that is biased, um, any provider may be uh, um, you know, committing civil rights violations and may have criminal criminal penalties. So this proposal right now, uh, you know, many discussions going back and forth and comment, the comment period is still open, but that is, you know, another shows, and again, this concern about uh, biased AI. So these concerns are real and need to be addressed upfront. And um, when you don't do that, and when you do it reactively, it can really delay or actually uh, kill adoption. And you can see that with gene therapy, where in the past, uh, there was really promising gene therapy being developed in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, and that there were some poorly overseen unethical uh, gene therapy trials when people died. And essentially, uh, a moratorium was placed on research and, and treatment and regulation of, of gene therapy. And it took 20 more years until 2017 before FDA approved the first ever gene therapy for, uh, you know, in this case, a retina disease. Of course, Theranos was a you know, really bad ethics that we still run into, you know, if you say, well, this this computer makes a diagnosis, sounds very exciting, promising, but so did Theranos. And, and so we still run into that. And then, for example, last year, there was a cerebral, a very unethical behavior about prescription, and, and that, that led to a lot of problems on the, on the telehealth uh, side. In fact, uh, ethics for AI are so important that many <laughs> uh, large tech companies are trying to deal with it, and typically they have ethical experts and ethical uh, uh, AI ethics committees. You can see here some publicity about two uh, of the larger tech companies. Um, and in my view, that's, that's interesting, but it's typically ethical experts who detect from looking from the outside um, rather than in the technology developers from the inside. And there's, of course, another model, uh, which I think is more attractive, that you have rather than these discussions and these words and you are ethical and you're not ethical and uh, engineers like uh, measurements, like right? the measurement, uh, measure things, 
And so metrics for ethics uh, that any engineer can test their own, you know, maybe the code or whatever they're developing, uh, how far it meets uh, various metrics, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very different model, but uh, probably more suited than, you know, these people, um, you know, fighting uh, in the streets about uh, what is ethical, uh, what is ethical, what is not ethical. And we see that we're starting to see that again with OpenAI and ChatGPT, of course. And so uh, ethical framework is key. Um, you know, we are not the only group who has published uh, on this, but there was an entire issue of the American Journal of Bioethics uh, dedicated to our, uh, uh, our, our, our ethical framework. And I think it was just very exciting uh, to publish that because it, it, it laid the foundation for all the other work. And three important things I do want to mention because I mentioned this, this metrics for ethics concept. And so you see here three famous ethical principles in, in healthcare specifically are First, do no harm or non-maleficence. And if you're an engineer, you probably see this as, well, you can do no harm on one side, but it's maybe also good to have a benefit and that's really one axis. And so patient benefit or non-harm really is, is maybe seen as a single uh, ethical principle, top left of this figure. Uh, top right of the figure is, is what is called justice as a bioethical principle, but because FDA cannot use justice in that form, and FDA and I work a lot on this. We decided to call it equity, but essentially it's it's not about individual patient benefit, but as a group, are there uh, differences or are, are people being, uh, um, for example, getting care uh, uh, e equally easily rather than looking at the individual patient. And then the third one uh, that we consider here is autonomy on the bottom, um, that the patient uh, decides and that patients are in control of the healthcare. And now if you if you see this algorithm in the, in the center, it can be an AI system, it can even be a provider like you and me, or it can be a really healthcare system. They need to find a balance between these ethical principles because it is impossible to meet each of these ethical principles 100%. You cannot be perfectly patient beneficial and also perfectly uh, equitable or justice and also patient autonomy. I'm sure you can think of uh, uh, examples where uh, by um, lessening patient autonomy, you can actually improve outcome. And then, of course, you need to find a balance. How much, you know, just uh, look at smoking, right? And uh, smoking cessation and, and everything we try to do about it, that is not leaving the patient totally deciding for themselves. And so an AI system or anything really has to find a, a balance. And there's then tension. We call it the Pareto optimum, where you try to meet equally these different um, these different ethical principles. And the, and the key insight, I think, of, of, of our work is, is that you can measure these, not with one metric. There's not one metric for patient benefit. There's many metrics, but there are metrics, and you can measure for an AI system whether it meets those. Similarly, for justice or health equity, similarly for autonomy, and similarly for responsibility and other uh, bioethical principles. But we really focused on these three because these were really the, the, the groundwork for regulation. And you can see the work here where we, we had this foundation and we then used it in what is called the foundational principles of AI workgroup created in the so-called collaborative community by uh, FDA, but with um, uh, people, representatives from tech companies, AI creators, bioethicists, uh, regulators from FDA, uh, FTC, um, uh, many others, patient organizations, uh, physician organizations, all coming together to try to use these ethical foundation to come up with, with considerations, we call it, we have to be very careful here, legally uh, for FDA and other regulators it's used around the world. And so you see the, the first paper uh, came out about two years ago, very exciting. Um, and here's a listing of, of, of the membership at the time. And you can see it's all over, it's from academics, it's from tech, uh, from um, clinicians, from patients, from ethicists and from FDA, uh, a lot of leadership from FDA. Um, of course, another matter, and I already mentioned that, is that reimbursement matters for patient access. Uh, and you can see that in, in this example, uh, in my view, wonderful uh, AI for um, addiction. This, this was an app created by Pair Therapeutics. They had FDA approval. They had many randomized clinical trials showing patient benefit, but they couldn't get uh, um, reimbursement uh, solved. Uh, and they went bankrupt a few months ago and all this work um, went to nil, it's, it's gone. And it doesn't benefit patients anymore because they couldn't get this, 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 this very important financial aspect to work. And so we worked based on this, again, this ethical framework. We also worked on an ethical foundation for reimbursement. 
how can you get as an AI creator to the right charge? And you know, right is is of course uh, interpretable, um, but one that is defensible for all stakeholders. And so we got all stakeholders on this paper. This is the RUC, uh, AI creators, uh, um, uh, healthcare systems who serve the underserved populations, payers. Um, all working together on a reimbursement frame for artificial intelligence. So essentially, there's some equations in there. You can put it in numbers uh, where you want to go, but it's it's defensible from an ethical perspective. And I think that really helped make stakeholders, including payers, especially in patient organizations and, and physician organizations, comfortable with how the charge was set. And therefore, uh, the recommendation, in my view, was followed by CMS, leading to a $55 reimbursement a few years later. But that was really exciting uh, uh, work. Um, another example is uh, the, the paper that I mentioned uh, came out two days ago in Nature Digital Medicine, uh, titled Considerations for Addressing Bias in AI for Health Equity. And this was, uh, you, you may see uh, Bill Meisel, the, the senior author, who's the, actually the chief medical officer of FDA, many FDA uh, directors and, 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 and us all working together on um, how do we deal uh, with bias? How can we measure it? I mentioned metrics for ethics. How, how can we mitigate it? And we, we realized that, uh, and you can see Ziad Obermeyer was the, he's at Berkeley and he's really working on, on, on these studies of AI bias and harm for patients where he, he proved that, which was very important for these, these, these proposed rules about, uh, you know, liability and AI bias. So really made sure that, you know, everyone uh, came together to try to work this out. And, and I think this is a key figure here where you see the life cycle of an AI, where you start with the concept, uh, what disease, what level of disease, what um, what input, like, you know, maybe EHR uh, text data, or do we use images? And what type of camera, what is the cost? Uh, where will it be used? What will the output be to the design, the engineering, the development, maybe training, uh, cycles and of course uh, incremental improvements, validation in maybe clinical trials, and then ultimately um, access, meaning deploying it, monitoring its performance in the real world. At all of these stages, uh, we realized and we we documented and we showed in this study that uh, bias can be introduced, but it can also be and needs to be mitigated. Um, it can never be you know perfectly. Uh, solved, but it needs to be analyzed and mitigated along each of these phases. And I think that's the important contribution that it's not just about what is men oftentimes mentioned, uh, bias in the training data, right? Where maybe uh, training data was a bit a bit skewed about maybe a certain race and pigmentation and where maybe fewer cases of disease than uh, on average. And of course, if you train on, on such data, Next time it sees a patient with less pigmentation, with more pigmentation, it will say, well, it's probably less likely to have disease and now you have a bias. That is obvious uh, uh, bias, but it's from the training data, but there's so many more places where bias can be introduced. If you have a very expensive hardware, uh, it may be that the AI can only be used in very wealthy areas and not in, in more unserved areas. And so you're essentially building in a bias just by the choice of the hardware Maybe it's easier to build an AI that performs highly with high quality hardware, but maybe it's 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 worth considering whether a high performing AI with lower cost hardware is is maybe a more um, a less biased solution. And of course, again, we cannot exclude the bias, but you need to at least uh, show that you start to address it and mitigate it. Um, also, very proud. Uh, this is work with uh, with with Harold, as you see, is the senior author, and I'm just in between here. So we have been working on what we call a policy model, essentially trying to figure out if you have AI, uh, what is the, the, the patient benefit at the population uh, level? Uh, and that you know comes back to metrics for ethics. How do you, not only when you're developing the AI, but actually when it's in the real world and, and, and collecting data, how do, you, how do you know that it's actually doing what you set out to do? I see some questions in the, in the chat. Uh, Harold, do you want to? To address this now, or let me go on. I let it let you go on. I think it'll be okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, I'll skip this. So I mentioned uh, uh, response and medical liability, and and so I I did want to mention a few words uh, about that. So it's not 
The AI, um, uh, and this is a famous example, the sensitivity is 87%, sens specificity about 91%, and so it's not perfect. Uh, I, as a, a retina specialist, have a sensitivity of about 50 to 60% for the same sp very specific level of disease. This is not because I'm a bad doctor, it's just a very hard uh, to diagnose uh, level of disease. And, and so the AI is, will make errors. Uh, so the liability is not about uh, each error, just like if, if, if you make an error as a physician, typically uh, in a mal medical malpractice lawsuit, if you document it carefully, uh, if there's not a pattern of uh, behavior, is there, if there's training, people and juries typically accept that uh, things can go wrong. What is less acceptable is if there is an, a pattern of uh, misdiagnoses, if there's a pattern of not uh, appropriate uh, training or board certification or or not documenting, et cetera. Now juries uh, take a much harder look uh, at at least the medical malpractice lawsuits I've been involved in as, a, as an expert witness. And and uh, here what we worked out is similarly for AI, if, if the AI performs according to what the FDA or other regulatory agencies signed off on, um, then you know you 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 know you have a, a, a known failure rate in this case, uh, thirty percent missed cases. The, the, these are the least severe cases, and then we already showed that most severe cases are almost never missed. But they will be missed in the real world. People will go blind as a result of a misdiagnosis by an autonomous AI. Um, and so it's more: is there uh, continuous monitoring of the performance to make sure that it indeed. Uh, keeps meeting uh, the standards that were set in, in the regulatory approval and the, the clinical trials that were done and led to the approval. So that's what this is about. Uh, but it is a high standard for AI creators, autonomous AI creators to be held to. Of course, for assistive AIs, it's very different because here, um, as an AI creator, you have limited control over what uh, the physician who's ultimately liable and uh, held responsible will say um, and will decide. And so that's that's a different matter. There may be partial liability and we've seen some some litigation uh, around that but that's definitely different from autonomous uh, ai so i think an autonomous uh, sorry an, an important criterion for autonomous ai is uh, you know really uh, are you are you uh, willing to take on uh, liability because there are uh, differences in reimbursement as we will see uh, i mentioned uh, uh, autonomy one important aspect is uh, uh, data usage and ownership and I like to mention this so much because on the bottom left, um, we have HIPAA, but there's really no good solution right now for where I think this is going. So if you look on the bottom left, uh, if you ask a, a group of different types of people who owns patient data, uh, they all say yes. Patients do, physicians think they do, payers do think they do, healthcare systems do, and even EHR companies think they own patient-derived data. And so that cannot, you know, really be true. Epic doesn't really, really address it. Um, and, you know, we'll solve it. But the point is that for if you're an AI creator and use data for your training data for otherwise, this is an important issue because I remind you of the Henrietta Lacks affair. Um, and in uh, 1951, and you're probably familiar with that issue if you're a provider, Henrietta Lacks was a patient. Her cells, uh, she had lymphoma, her cells uh, were taken. Right, uh, oh. I'll remind you that this happened at Johns Hopkins, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I have a standard slide. Sorry about that. But yes. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the cells were 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 taken without her, her knowledge or consent. She later passed away from this disease, and this was to make the diagnosis. But the cell line was so important for research and even uh, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals that it's still being used today. That cell line is immortal, um, and is and, and billions of dollars have been have been made thanks to that cell line. But uh, the family, her estate, did not was not aware of the cell line existence until many, many, many years later. And there were some lawsuits, and they got uh, big awards uh, because they said, "Well, you know, we we own part of this. We never get permission." You, at the time, there was no legal framework for taking these cells, and you can see that even though there was no legal framework, it can still lead to to major lawsuits and and settlements and and. Uh, you know, books have been written. There's a, a TV series uh, about her, about this case. Very interesting case, of course. But if you're an, you know, a creator of AI, you need to take into account that there, there may be litigation in the future, and this may be solved uh, legally, in a way. And you can, and until recently, I didn't really have an example in AI. Uh, but now, uh, you know, with the recent LLM um, things this year, 
bottom right, you can see that, that artists are now filing lawsuits against um, AI creators that use their art, in, in this case, uh, pictorial art, as training data to, you know, like Mid Journey, right? And, and Del E use training data uh, uh, grabbed from the web. And now the artists that created that art say, well, we want part of that, or at least, you know, here's, where's our ownership? And so there's actually an example already of if you use data, people may start to say, well, I was a patient and I never knew about uh, people making billions of dollars of, of, with an AI. Not that it is the case in any AI currently. Uh, you know, it's still early day uh, in terms of billions of dollars of, of revenue, let alone profit. But, you know, if we're successful, and, and I think we need to be for the benefit of patients and health equity and better access and lower healthcare costs, then, you know, there will be, there will be issues uh, going forward. Um, I already mentioned uh, the, 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 the various stakeholders, and in this case for reimbursement, I didn't bring that up because it was such a big uh, moment that... Uh, CMS really carefully considered uh, this reimbursement, this proposed reimbursement, um, and, and literally 30 pages in the Federal Register were spent on discussing the back and forth for establishing a precedent for 9229, which is the diabetic eye exam performed by an autonomous AI. And how do we reimbursement? Where do we get it from? Uh, it had never been done because everything in the healthcare system, including reimbursement, has always been based on humans doing stuff. And now it's a computer doing stuff, and you know how do you how do you look at that? How you consider that? And that's what where our you know uh, reimbursement framework I think came in really helpful, and uh, it continues to be used. Uh, you know, uh, uh, establishing uh, reimbursement for pairs payers, and you know even right now there's a comment period that just closed for CMS for next year. Um, I'll skip this. Um, I already mentioned uh, the importance. So if you are maybe thinking about creating an AI, it's not only reimbursement, but also all these factors having to do with value-based care. Um, uh, I name uh, MIPS and HEDIS, but there's also um, HCC or um, um, relative uh, risk uh, adjustment factors uh, that, that play a role for what the output of the AI does, what it actually, what, what is its indications for use, how can it help solve a problem that uh, physicians have meeting HEDIS or MIPS? And in this case, uh, took some work, but again, stakeholder support was key here. And, you know, very proud to say that uh, the diabetic eye exam can now be closed by an AI. It's, you see there the AI interpretation meets criteria in the blue bottom right here. I don't see it because I see your faces. So. Um, well, and, and, and as I mentioned on the timeline, uh, right, uh, and very proud, uh, you know, working with, 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 with Hopkins, uh, there's just an amazing uh, team of people in, both in endocrinology, in ophthalmology, in primary care, uh, but also in, in informatics and in operations research. There's just so much knowledge, and I'm so proud to work uh, with, 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 with all of these people. And we were, you know, the first... Um, peer-reviewed uh, evidence that indeed autonomous AI can directly address health disparities and close um, uh, the, the, the disparity gap between, in this case, uh, white, Hispanic, and, and black populations in the Baltimore area uh, is now there. Uh, there's uh, the results of a randomized clinical trial, very exciting. It's still not fully accepted, so I can mention that, but uh, we're getting there and, and you know expect to, to see that in press uh, very soon. Um, uh, did want to mention, oh, sorry, I didn't expect that, sorry, um, that the other one, uh, productivity, where we showed a randomized clinical trial in Bangladesh, in fact, in a in developing country where there's a great a lack of access to diabetic eye exams, um, that proof has now been given, has been accepted by nature, and um, I can't show you the proof yet, but that's coming out uh, in the next few weeks, so very exciting that a randomized clinical trial can show that a healthcare system becomes more productive uh, thanks to autonomous AI. I would love to have questions if there's uh, enough questions, otherwise I can talk. Uh, I think you've kind of answered the question implicitly, but can you be more explicit about how what you're talking about? We've had decision support for years, for 30 years. Yeah. What, 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 yeah, what's... Great point. I, I should probably put on that assistive. So uh, with the CPT uh, editorial panel, we we published what is called Supplement uh, S, which talks about 
autonomous assistive and augmentative AI, which is very important for reimbursement and for, for payers. Um, I think uh, clinical decision support falls in the assistive bucket, right? I mean, if you're a physician and you use a CDS, uh, it's, it, it allows you hopefully to make a better decision. There's a lot of questions to be asked about how you prove that compared to autonomous AI, which literally you compare the output to, in this case, clinical outcome. Um, but no, I, in my view, CDS is, is, is very much on the assistive side. I don't know whether that helps answer the question. Um, sorry, so clinical decision support, the autonomy is depending on your level, right? So if, if you're a primary care physician and you use this specific autonomous AI to do the diabetic eye exam, which you do not do and do not want to do yourself, it's fully autonomous. Right, you you do not look at the patient, you do not evaluate. You just say, "Oh, the, the diagnostic uh, a autonomous AI said this. I'm following that, and I, I use that um, to decide that we don't need to do anything with this patient as far as the eyes are concerned." And so, at that level, it's autonomous. And but at another level, you can say, "Well, I'm a provider managing the patient entire diabetes, including complications like eye complications." you know, um, uh, peripheral neuropathy. And part of that is making sure that there's no eye complications today. And then it's part of the management and now it's a CDS. So autonomy is really depending on which uh, angle you look at. Uh, I think maybe that's why there's a little bit of confusion. What's the ethical difference though between the assistive then and the autonomous? The ethical framework can be used for, for anything. I mean, you can measure the ethics, how many, much different ethical principles are, are, are met for anything. The, the one thing I want to say is that um, CDS is really where you study it as a combo of, of a physician and the CDS, because ultimately it's about the effect on patient outcome, which is this clinical decision. And the problem is, of course, that we as clinicians are very variable, and I very like in, in about 30% of cases with my, my, my very experienced colleagues. And probably uh, most providers do there's a lot of literature about that. And so you cannot take uh, uh, in a clinical trial one CDS, which is hopefully a locked system. We'll get back to that because I saw the chat GPT question. A locked system combined with variable clinicians. So you need to really look at a spectrum of clinicians to validate the output of the combination of CDS with a clinician to know whether it's any good. Because just measuring the CDS in isolation has led to, uh, for example, the Boeing 737 MAX problem, right? Where uh, Boeing made an AI uh, to correct uh, the aileron, worked really well, but they didn't in, in, you know, test it together with pilot, pilots and it worked really well, they did with some pilots. It worked really good with experienced former Navy pilots, but then you had less experienced pilots and they started to overcorrect and drove two planes into the ground because it was not fully validated with less experienced pilots. And you can see that even though in isolation, this, uh, this CDS may work well, uh, it may not do that in combination with this, you know, this you know, human flawed clinician. In fact, there was a very important paper in 2007 um, in New England Journal of Medicine uh, where FDA had approved a mammography uh, AI, it was assistive uh, by a company called R2, um, and it was being used. And it was uh, the clinical trial compared the AI in isolation, essentially autonomous, uh, to radiologists, and it performed really, really well. And it was being used in a very different manner, assistive, meaning it read the, uh, the mammogram, it told the radiologist, hey, there's classification here, nodule there, can you look more carefully? And then um, uh, a study was done on 200,000 women looking at the difference in outcome between radiologists alone and radiologists with an assistive AI or maybe CDS. And the outcomes were worse uh, with AI. The AI made the outcomes worse. And, and so we have to be careful when we say automatically expect the AI to make things better. It doesn't. And so, so I think my view, ethically, you need to prove that. Even if there are no ethical differences, isn't it great that that CDSs are getting this attention, which they have not had before. Exactly, exactly. So it's painful because so, you, know, you want to so stop. It's expensive. So Doctor Siegel, I would say this is a this is a feature, not a bug. And <laughs> thank goodness people are actually taking ethical issues seriously. Um, Paul, do you want to say ask something? Or I think that's really fascinating that even with assistive AI, it could actually worsen performance because of dependencies and atrophy and other types of behavior changes. I guess what I always struggle with 
is uh, the things I'd like to see in AI are transparency uh, and learnability. And I always figure, you know, I always see the learnability side of AI. If a physician uses an AI and says the AI gets it wrong, how does, you know, you know, how do we then adopt that new knowledge into the model? I mean, and especially when it comes to the FDA, it seems like that journey is going to take years uh, for that, for that, for that, uh, that learnability aspect of AI when it's encountering potentially new data that uh, beyond what it was trained to, to build its models around. I have a very strong stance and Bakul Patel, who was formerly at FDA, he was a big fa in favor of cont continuous learning, which is exactly what you described. You have an AI, it is FDA cleared, we know it's safe and effective. We use it in the field. Uh, the AI sees a patient, some physician disagrees, uh, and now we can improve the AI if the physician is right. What we discussed with, with FDA is that we created a hierarchy or a metric for reference standards where we said, well, ultimately it should be about clinical outcome in chronic disease. Maybe you need a prognostic standard and lower and lower you start comparing to physicians because you as a patient do not care whether physicians agree or disagree on your disease. You want to know where you're going to die or go blind or not and what the best treatment is. So it should be about outcome. And we decided to validate this AI against clinical outcome, a you know, proxy for that because it's chronic disease. That's why I'm able and FDA allows me to say it's better than me. If you compare it to a bunch of physicians, you can never say it's better because how would you know? And so, so back to, to the ethics really, the, the cool thing about autonomous AI is that you can lock it, you can study it in isolation and you know exactly what it does because it's deterministic. And that in my view means the highest ethical standard of patient benefit. If you know once, you know forever. Now you have a continuous learning AI. It's okay because sometimes you know the outcome, but not in chronic diseases. So let's say I, I'm working with some people on a NICU uh, ventilator AI, uh, where if the AI predicts that uh, the patient, the baby can do without the ventilator, um, if, the, if there's respiratory distress, you will know in seconds. So you have a true to label immediately. There you can probably do a form of continuous learning. But in chronic diseases, which in my view is where especially autonomous AI and access problems are the biggest problem, it may take 10 years for the, the, the result of your medical decision to manifest. So now you may actually be making the, the AI worse by incorporating the bad decision of a clinician. And you do not know. The only way to know is to put a very expensive prognostic standard, which is in our case, it's $55 per patient for CMS, but to do this prognostic standard, you need like $5,000 per patient, very complicated equipment, uh, highly paid uh, operators, and you would do that in an FQHC in a grocery store, it's never going to work. So he did debates with Baku Patel, who's not Google. And ultimately, I, I think we haven't heard much about continuous learning anymore. We need to solve that because on the other hand, we don't want, and that's the problem right now, where we lock it down, everyone feels safe because the clinical trial has been done. And now you want to change it because just because you have better algorithms. And right now, that's a challenge for FDA. That's a very heated debate about how to, how to deal with this. And we were getting there, but we're not fully there yet. So it's, it's very hot, very immediate. And we are actually you know, working on a paper about that. The technology changes. And yes. the problem I have with a lot of this AI, where you add the data and the technology, is you now have a high interest card of technology debt uh, that needs to be managed. Yes, uh, and uh, every day. that debt is building every day. That's that's right. Uh, I do like, uh, yeah, but I I agree. We haven't really tackled the learnability challenges, and I like the fact that you're right. You need to go to outcomes. You need to go beyond the standard of adjudication of peer review of 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 physicians as a gold standard in some cases. Uh, but it, it is uh, it is certainly a very open open area of, of research right now. Yeah, yeah, great. I love the question. I should know this. Asking about LLMs and Chat GPT. Do you want to tackle? Do you want to tackle that one, or do you want to say you don't know where the data is? You don't know what to say. Like I said, I'm a big proponent of, of deterministic log systems where you know what to do. Uh, we actually had a paper recently in American Journal of Dietetics about ChatGPT for conversational therapy. And, and you may say, well, today I know there's no bias because you tested it in, in, in some type of study. And as you well know, ChatGPT is changing by the minute. 
And so tomorrow already you don't know whether anymore whether it's safe and unbiased. So if you now have this proposed rule saying that you will be held liable uh, for civil rights violations if you use an AI and ChatGPT is provable uh, biased, um, I think you have to be very careful for including that in your patient decisions. Ultimately, I don't think uh, a jury is going, uh, I, don't, I cannot speak on behalf of jury. I would be careful with using this or documenting that you use this in a, in a clinical decision. In your timeline that started with the AI and went through all the different phases, I was struck that that doesn't seem right. You should put the bias and ethical concerns before you build the AI, right? Yes. Well, in, in, in the paper that literally came out two days ago, yes, we say you need to start thinking about it as a concept. But typically, when you encounter someone uh, you know, who has an AI, they typically have an AI and haven't really thought about all the, you know, the, the different areas of AI. So it's more, hey, I got an AI. I'm so excited. I want to use patient benefit. Well, duh, here's all the steps you need to go through. That, that, yes, so you're right. We got to figure out how to get the bias concerns formally. So that's related. You, you talk a lot about me the metrics. Uh, maybe I missed it in the foundation's paper, but I didn't see what the metrics actually are for autonomy and for equity. We touched upon it in the framework, but it really came. That was why it was exciting. So there we discussed, well, here's the various phases and here's how you can work on the different ethical aspects and which should you include. That was the ethical framework. I think the foundational considerations really operationalize that, meaning, oh, you have an ethical principle, you want to incorporate it, how do you measure it? And there we started to define what is a metric for a reference standard? What is a metric for how you get to the thresholds, right? But what threshold should you use for sensitivity, specificity, et cetera? How do you come to that? And, and so there's... There's processes and metrics all defined in that paper. I think that is the key where the metrics for ethics really came to, to the fore. The jury is that whether that's actually feasible, right? Whether Pareto optimality is actually feasible, ethical, possible. And then he's pointing out it'll lead to a decrease in your beneficence. But I posit that if you have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity, there's something else that's being affected. So... You're totally right. There will be um, there will be impacts. We had to show, and we showed that there was no difference in accuracy between different races and ethnicities, for example, in different ages. And um, and you 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 can build AIs for a very small segment of the population where they have a very high sensitivity to specificity. But as soon as you start to generalize, you will lose that. And so the choice to make an AI only for a very small segment of the population. That's an ethical thing, right? I mean, and that's a decision. I'm not saying the ethics, in my view, doesn't tell you what is good or right. It does uh, allow, it does give you a framework for analyzing these questions and making sure that you understand why you're being pushed in a certain direction. But no, you, you, it actually uh, does lead to this, the, finding this balance. And you can, you know, optimize these balances in various ways. I just think Pareto is where... You know, the, the, the pooling, for example, in the proposed rule in CMS is literally was sort of a Pareto process where every stakeholder as every constituency wants, you know, their own thing met, uh, met and and yeah, maybe maybe I'm too optimistic that it is formally a Pareto optimization, but yeah, I, I think that's where it's going. So who's going to monitor that meta issue? Who's going to monitor the performance of the AI and who's going to monitor the, the meta issue of who... What, how is that Pareto optimality chosen? How is that decided? How... Well, the things I do are under a very strict regulatory framework where everyone is looking, including FDA and FTC. There's a lot of AI that is not monitored by anyone. And, and the science paper by Giot Obermeyer is a famous example. A payer uh, created an AI that was used to decide who got which type of uh, uh, disease management for lung disease. And it so happened that they used cost, cost as a proxy for severity of the disease. This was actually being used. And it turned out that black patients had for the same severity of disease, less cost. Therefore, the AI was tremendously biased and, and black patients were actually harmed, have been harmed. And so uh, Optum, the company who did this, you know, corrected that when they, when she had contained. But it was a, a big proof that there's no regulation whatsoever in many cases of AI. As a physician, you can build any AI you want and use it in your own clinic. There's no regulation except with the proposed rule from um, Office of Civil Rights now as various state organizations. Um, I would argue, and I think in the Coalition for Healthcare AI and other fora, 
I would argue this may be harming uh, AI in general and all the benefits we're starting to get because people in Congress will say, we don't want any AI anymore, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, we need to be careful as AI creators, but also as users. And we can sort of offload to an organization like FDA, which we do the same for any, any pharma drug. I'm not going to do my own trials for my own patients you know, with a new, uh, even though I use a lot of off-label stuff, I look at the literature. So the healthcare community as a whole is responsible for looking at it and looking at the evidence for doing the trials, for monitoring it once it's in use, you know, that we, we're doing that with the FDA. But of course, regulators like FDA has a tremendous weight. And I can tell you that in other areas of the world, um, FDA is, you know, it's, it's very beneficial because it allows you to say this is safe. You can now say it's safe. In, in in some areas of the world, it's really important that the FDA be said it. And literally in Bangladesh, in, in, in other countries, we, we are able to, to use these EIs because the FDA decision. In other areas, there's no such thing. And there's very little regulatory oversight and no one trusts the AIs. And it leads to lack of adoption or reimbursement, other problems. And so you see a big gap now between you know, enthusiastic embracement of AI where, where there's strong regulations versus uh, much weaker. So great question. I can go on forever, but yeah. Um, I just want to thank all this, the, the students in particular for getting being so engaged. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all the other questions. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. I really liked the, the fact that you stressed uh, that we should be looking at AI compared to the standard of practice in medicine, that we can, you know, we always think of trying to make AI perfect. Uh, but the truth is that we really, you really have to look at the standards of practice to see where there's gaps and where even there's always going to be some some challenges with AI. Uh, and the biggest concerns, of course, that we have is the bias in AI to, to unseen data that it hasn't been exposed to yet. But uh, I find that the, that was a really great discussion of trying to understand the different aspects of the ethics around AI. And so, so thank you so much. With that, we'll close out uh, today's Grand Rounds. Thank you very much.